The Center for Research in Post-Humanities, Bankura University presents a two-day international conference on post-human condition in the Anthropocene, held on 2nd and March 3, 2024. Nikita Prokhorov, Ph.D. graduate student, University of California, Irvine, Department of Philosophy is going to speak on living spaces, reimaging environments of desire. Good morning, Nikita. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Uh, yes, uh, I'm fine. So uh, this is going to be our uh, first session of this day. Uh, I'm Sukhendra Das, and I coordinate the Center for Research in post at Bakura University. It's my pleasure and an honor to introduce our first speaker, Nikita Pokhorov. Uh, Nikita is a philosophy PhD student at the University of California, Irvine, working as an epistemologist of multi-interspecies interaction and in activist in counts of cognition, operating within the field of critical and critical planned studies, Nikita's primary projects center on the anthropocentricizing concepts of intelligence and agency with respect to vegetal beings, utilizing novel readings of Christian philosophy of language on epistemology. I now welcome Nikita. Uh, Nikita, the whole virtual platform is now all yours. So thank you so much for um, attending my talk um, today. Uh, I specifically, um, so my talk is titled Living Spaces, Reimagining Environments of Desire. Um, specifically, uh, I will be addressing uh, how domesticity and wildness are addressed in Jack Halberstam's philosophy and subsequently how we can make particular um how we can use particular imaginaries to um push the conception of the wild that halberson um, provides so first let me provide a brief outline of the paper and presentation that i'm going to give right now so first um i'm going to provide a brief account of wildness as explained by jack halberstam uh, specifically, I'm incredibly interested in uh, drawing out Halberstam's um, use of wildness as a uh, way of distancing from the domestic and as uh, resisting colonial and heteronormative pressures and con uh, like ways of controlling desire. Um, however, I think that as much as much as uh, beauty and uh, theoretical use there might be in um, Halberstam's account of wildness, I think um, his way of framing it with respect to domesticity um, limits its potential. And I think that being able to push the conception of wildness into the domestic, using some of the examples that I'll be going through today, um, will hopefully expand the concept and allow us to maybe um, conceive of imaginaries or relationships um, with our own domestic spaces that are wild and allow us to free our desires. So in order to do that, um, I'm going to be looking at two novels today, specifically Jenny Vall's uh, novel uh, from 2018, Paradise Rot, and Octavia Butler's science fiction novel, Dawn. Um, and then I will be, you know, sort of connecting them to this analysis of wildness and domesticity um, before kind of trying to bring it to a conclusion um, with some reflections. So allow me to first introduce Jack Halberstam's account of wildness and domesticity. So specifically, um, uh, Halberstam uses uh so in his book wild things the disorder of desire he specifically critiques how our desires have been structured and organized by heteronormative and colonial forces the domestic and the wild are centered throughout his critique and explicitly contrasted as ontologies of control and freedom respectively the title of the book wild things is a reference to the child uh, child novel child book um, where the wild things are about a small boy who um uses his imagination to escape home and explore um, a wild space full of creatures. Um, 
Halberstam emphasizes throughout his work uh, his distrust of the domestic and of the interior. So specifically with regards to desire, um, he points towards and critiques Eve Sedgwick's epistemology of the closet, which has been critiqued by queer theorists um, and is being critiqued by queer theorists. Um, however, Halberstam's specific um, issue with Sedgwick um, is that specifically the closet quote has been proven to be too narrow and even the domestic as a symbol and numerous critics have proposed other epistemologies over the years. Um, and it's specifically this kind of interiority that Halberstam seems to be pushing against with his uh, description of the wild. Going back to the, the novel, the childhood book, where the wild things are, the main character, Max, I'll just quote this passage, describing how he relates to um, his home. Quote, Max is young. He inhabits the, the family home against his own will. He simultaneously destroys that home and it attempts to build another world within it. He uses books practically and not metaphysically, and he drapes himself in the costume of wild animals, signifying the chaos of childhood. And the reason that Halberstam makes this particular example so centric, so central to um, the theme of his book, although he doesn't return to it uh, consistently, um, is that the domestic and the wild are at odds with each other and that the wild is a way of freeing oneself from a lot of the cultural um, norms and expectations of human society. So given, you know, this conversation of wildness and its contrast to the domestic, what actually is wildness to Halberstam then? So to Halberstam, the wild is a lot of things. Um, Specifically, I'll, I'll just read these passages since I have the time, I suppose. Um, quote, the epistemology of the Ferox offers us not only a non-medicalized, non-moralizing relation to contrary desires and genders. It also opens onto other relations to life, death, animality, the wild, strange, the inexplicable. And the feral indeed is situated beyond human language and cannot be and can only be approximated using the grammars available for expressions of love, desire, and sex. So here we see that Halberstam positions the wild as something specifically outside of human culture, human morals, and human psychological or medical explanation. So in uh, Halberstam's epistemology of the wild, there is no space or reason for us to have judgment about desire or how that desire um, is expressed. And psychoanalytic readings, uh, medical readings have no, have no place. Um, rather, on the other hand, um, this kind of relation to the world allows for a opening up of desires and ex ways of expressing oneself with respect to things that are typically taboo, such as life, death, animality, the wild, etc. Contrasting with the domestic, as I was doing in the previous slides, the epistemology of wildness or an epistemology of the ferox, which is Halberstam explores throughout the book. Or So the ferox is um, a synonym for feral in this context. Both swap out the image of an interior room representing a secret self for a wide open space across which an unknowable self is dispersed. So here we see the tension between freedom and expression and control and restriction from the domestic. And while Halberstam's critiques of heteronormativity and of colonial um, controls of desire are incredibly potent and valid. I think that something that this conception of the wild could benefit from in this particular case is allowing it for it to situate itself within the domestic space and allowing the domestic to be wild in some capacity. So how do I you know, what examples or what case do I have um, for this particular claim? So first, I want to turn to Jenny Vall's novel, Paradise Rock, and specifically look at it as an example of how uh, the wilding of an interior space allows for um, increased um, expression of desire, reflection, and um, freedom in that particular sense. Um, but specifically, it only comes through the kind of 
rewilding or the allowing of the wild to appear in the domestic for that to happen. So how does that how does that look in Jenny Vall's novel? Um, so specifically, uh, Jenny Vall's narrative, the book Paradise Rot, follows a Norwegian international student, Joe, attending university at Southern England to study biology. As she settles into her new apartment, a repurposed brewery with her roommate, Carol, she finds the space around her changing. The bleakness of the exterior world is slowly pressed out as the brewery is taken over by a variety of plants, fungi, and insects. In their paradise of decomposition, Joe's sexuality begins to free itself of patriarchal expectations. Rather than act like a closet, their brewery turned garden instead welcomes in male interlopers and allows the two female residents or and lovers to express their desires and then metaphorically consume the male um, visitors. In a final consummation at the end of the book, the two women become one with their life histories mycologically united during acts of queer tenderness, their life history is becoming confused and their identities becoming unclear. So this kind of intense queer relationality, however, is only possible as a result of the way in which they relate to the space around them, the apartment that we, they I live guess. in. However, um, oh, I apologize, I think I heard some talking. Um, however, the, uh, a, the apartment doesn't serve like a closet or a way of restricting desire. Rather, it welcomes it and allows it to flourish and grow. So the kind of language that Jenny Vall uses to describe the brewery as it changes and as it develops is incredibly intimate and erotic. Um, she writes that, quote, as winter settled in outside, that is the apartment in southern England, we were set upon by summer inside the brewery, as if the walls separated not only the out inside from the outside, but divided two different climates. On the floor, grass grew along the, the furring, yellow moss patches grew from the cracks in the cement, white spiders spun shining fur around the beams, and because of a spreading layer of greenish white mold, the breadcrumbs on the kitchen counter grew into a little carpet. I tried to trim the tufts and wash away the crawling maggots, but Carol cuddled up against me, took the washcloth and the scissors from my hands, and shook her head. So the space here is some is you know in contrast to the exterior world is something that's warm, nourishing, and full of growth. Um, now within literature, uh, female sexuality and vegetal sexuality have been closely linked. So. These two characters expressing and exploring their sexualities in this way, I mean, on a literary level, um, certainly follows that particular trope. However, what's particularly interesting is how the space around them becomes wild. And Joe, at this point, still unsure of her sexuality, feels this inclination to trim and control the space around her. However, Carol, at this point, the character is much more comfortable with her, uh, with her sexual identity and her attraction towards Joe, you know, keeps Joe from restraining the wildness growing in the apartment. And eventually, this restraint allows for them to use the plants in the apartment, in the brewery, as a way of mediating the de their desire and of um, growing closer together. So how does that specifically look? How does queer relationality um, change as the result of uh, wild growth in a domestic space, for example. So in the novel, we see the characters, specifically Joe, um, go through intense interspecies um, desires and mediated experiences. So for example, from this passage, I'll quote, quote, still I'd I still I'd felt see through. I'd imagine that I could see something growing in my belly, something that wouldn't be a proper fetus, but something much worse, a black and dead and rotten fruit. And yet, while the language here is incredibly dark and vivid, um, it uh, the the intimacy, the interspecies intimacy itself uh, subverts our expectations of what it means to give birth and to have intimate relationships. Another passage relates to when the two lovers, Joe and Carol, uh, finally begin to express their physical attraction for one another. Later that night when she came over and breathed on my neck again, I felt the same soft skin melt against mine as, that, as I felt earlier, touching the mushroom cap. I didn't move, but let her envelop me. 
So the fact that Joe, through touching the mushroom and through Carol's engagement with the plants in the apartment as well, that kind of relationality um, mediates Joe and Carol to be closer together and allows for them to, you know, quote unquote, envelop each other. When what does this look like specifically in um, for these two characters? What does it mean to mycologically um, change yourself and allow yourself to uh, experience intimacy with another person as mediated through wildness in your, your home, like a mushroom or something growing? Um, well, in the context for these two characters specifically, um, they had um, a male. Uh, neighbor who was a writer and of course uh, decided to give them a novel which uh, had two female characters in it and a male character and you know the two female characters in his novel were obvious stand-ins for Joe and Carol and um, the male character was an obvious stand-in for him and they had an orgy and uh, um, engaged in activities that would essentially um, satisfying uh, Pym, that is the male character's um, kind of heteronormative and patriarchal sexual expectations from these two women. Um, however, when he gives them the novel, Carol reads it first before Joe has a chance to get to it and adds a certain sec adds sections to the end of the story to change how it develops. Um, I'll just quote from one of Carol's editions that Joe eventually reads. Quote, the women feast on the poor man's flesh and chew each bone whilst it is fresh. So the two women can become one with a kiss, the dream of every biologist, to grow together in their pursuit and his red flesh, their forbidden fruit. He stumbles and gasps and finally dies from his ashes will a four breasted creature arise. So this interior space that they've created allows for their expression of desire, fosters it. And then even allows for them to take this kind of um, patriarchal male sexual presence that typically would use an interior domestic space to dominate and control and express itself in a kind of um, forceful way. Uh, rather, the space now turns to a kind of wild area that allows them to consume uh they're in the kind of interlopers and um, impositions that kind of arrive and allow them to engage in intimacy that's so close that they're literally able to merge. So moving on just for the sake of time um, to my next example, I want to look at um, Octavia Butler and her novel Dawn. Um, and specifically how, so while Jenny Vall's Paradise Rot allows us to recognize how our domestic living spaces may become wild and how that may in turn um, allow us to express our desires in this new and free way in a domestic space. Um, on while one is about going wild um, or allowing that space to turn wild, or Octavia Butler's Dawn, I would say, is about recognizing the animacy and intimacy of the space around you. Um, I actually talked about Dawn a little bit when I presented here last year, um, but specifically this time I want to be focusing on the relationship that the Owen Kali have to their ship. So who are the Owen Kali? What is the ship that I'm talking about? So Octavia Butler's alien abduction science fiction novel tells the story of Lilith Ayapo, a black anthropologist who wakes up aboard a biological alien spaceship inhabited by the gene trading Owen Kali aliens who travel the galaxies and exchange genetics between themselves and other species. Um, Witnessing a devastating nuclear war, the Owan Kali intervened and rescued a certain number of humans for gene exchange and eventual repopulation of Earth. And Lilith is um, evaluated and chosen as the sort of leader of the humans that are going to be sent back to Earth. 
However, gene alteration and human alien human romantic relationship blur the barriers and lines between environment, self, and other, and allow for a deeper intimacy while becoming something more than human. So, something I want to touch on very briefly that I is somewhat implicit, but I think I want to draw it out more explicitly is the biological nature of the ship. So the to the Oankali, everything on their ship is biological. Because they're gene traders, um, they're able to have an intensely intimate and pleasurable relationship with other living things. So to them, exchanging genes and genetics, um, DNA essentially, right, with other um living things brings them pleasure through sharing. Um, and because of this, they're able to, their spaceship in their home is a completely organic being full of various living things, the Owen Kali just being one of them. And that kind of relationship is incredibly deep and intimate to the point where they're fully dependent on each other. <clears throat> now, this kind of um, intimacy manifests itself in the Oankali allowing themselves to have an incredible amount of both agency in the world around them, but also, um, you know, tenderness, love, and respect. Um, so one example of that is how um, when Lilith was first brought onto the ship, she didn't have those particular, she didn't have certain abilities um, because she was still completely human. However, as the Owen Kali began to trust her more and see her character and you know, decide that they want her to lead the human uh, repopulation effort, they modify her genetics for her to be able to more closely um, experience uh, and interact with the ship. Quote, you can open walls now. Startled, she, she started at it, then went out to a wall and touched it with the fingertips of one hand. The wall reddened as Paul Titus's wall had under Nikonja's touch. Use all your fingers, it told her. She obeyed, touching the fingers of both hands to the wall. The wall indented and began to open. So here we see how even the walls of this ship are living things that respond to touch and intention. And Lilith being able to recognize that and now interact with it is has new relationalities epistemologies and ontology like ways of recognizing particular ontologies now available to her and this per in kind of shift in perspective is incredibly crucial here in dawn because for octavia butler um the central critique of humanity that she seems to be drink, uh, bringing out is the kind of tendency towards hierarchy towards control um so allowing oneself to have a queer and um, kind of horizontal ontology of relationality with other, um, with with the space around you, um, provides, and as we'll see, uh, as I'll demonstrate just shortly on the next slide, uh, allows you to um, express your desires in new ways. Um, just as a brief aside, the following slide has a, a reference to a sexual assault and attempted rape on Lilith. Um, it's not ex it's not entirely explicit uh, passage, but it does make reference to it, and I just wanted to give folks a head up, just in, you know, in case anyone wanted to pause for a moment. But okay, moving to the slide. So before Lilith has this change in perspective and genetics, where she's able to more closely align herself and experience the kind of animate living space around her. Uh, she has interactions with another human on the ship where he tries to rape her. And specifically, these kinds of um, hierarchical and uh, heteronormative violent relations uh, manifest themselves because that kind of human hierarchical tendency continues to be present within Paul Titus, the male who attempts to hurt her. Um, however, we can tell that in this passage, even Lilith still views herself and humans as other from the world around them, right? Because uh, she says, what do they care? They're just animals. Don't make yourself their dog, she pleaded. Don't do this. 
And she says specifically, and she makes a distinction between them and horses, saying that they're different, um, which reflects that at this stage, um, Lilith hasn't isn't quite um, in relation to it doesn't have an open set of relations to the space around her. And immediately following this interaction, uh, the Oan Kali begin to. Uh, give her the kinds of abilities to interact with the space very shortly thereafter. Um, however, as time goes on, um, we get to see what an alternative to the kind of heteronormative violent sexual relations that um, Octavia Butler critiques can look like. And what that looks like specifically when one has this intimate relationality with the world around you. Um, so the Oan Kali aliens have three genders, and this is important because they have males, females, and the Uloi, which um, the Uloi act as this uh, mediating gender, which can perform gene trading and allow um, living things to experience each other's personalities and emotions in full. So, uh, quote, only through me. Nikonja's voices insisted. Lilith's hand tingled. She released Joseph's hand and immediately received Joseph as a blanket of warmth and security, a compelling, steadying presence. And taking aside from the quote, here, um, Nikonj, the Uloi Kali, is touching both Lilith and Joseph, um, allowing, so they're not in contact and only in contact with the Uloi. She never knew whether she was receiving Nikonja's approximation of Joseph, a true transmission of what Joseph was feeling, some combination of truth and approximation, or just a pleasant fiction. What was Joseph feeling from her? It seemed to her that she had always been with him. She had no sensation of shifting gears, no time alone to contrast with the present time together. He had always been there, part of her, essential. Now their delight in one another ignited and burned. They moved together, sustaining an impossible intensity. Both of them tireless, perfectly matched, a blaze in sensation, lost in one another. They seemed to rush upward. A long time later, they seemed to drift down slowly, gradually savoring a few more moments wholly together. And what's important to remember here is this deeply passionate, deeply intimate relationship between two humans, Joseph and uh, Lilith, is one where they aren't physically touching or engaging with each other, but where they are having their experiences completely mediated by the Uloi, in the same way that the experience was mediated by the mushroom in Paradise Rot. The idea is that by allowing yourself to recognize the animacy and intimacy that you can have with the wild domestic space around you, um, your ability to express your desires and free your desires and relationality from heteronormative and patriarchal and colonial forms of control um, is possible and becomes something that's um, actionable. So, just to conclude, um, reading these two texts together, I propose that queer and interspecies imaginaries exist, which effectively demonstrate possibilities for violence beyond Jack Halberstam's conception defined as a response to the domestic. I mean, obviously, Halberstam has um, much more to say about the wild than simply the domestic, but I think that his characterization of it could um, is, some, is in some ways limiting towards the potential of wildness to spread or make itself apparent. I hope that by taking these two incredibly different texts together under the lens of the wild, a possibility appears for recognizing the animacy agency and desires of the environment around us. Rather than limiting the wild from the domestic or interior, these texts press us to animate and destabilize the world around us in order to free our desires and sexualities. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's my talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Nikita, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, now I open this session to questions and question, answer, and observation, if there is any. Audience, would you like to ask any question to Nikita? Uh, thank you, Nikita, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a pleasure.